This is me. My name is Lucas. This is my father-in-law, John. And this is our friend, Doug. Why are we standing in a mountain stream in the middle of the jungle? Well, here's the deal. John and I work together with a group called Free Grace International. I write books like this one, and this one, and this one. A while back, I wrote a book called Salvation and Discipleship. Apparently, it's made its way around the world because a few years ago, we were told that some enthusiastic readers in Vanuatu, a place I'd never heard of, had read my book and wanted me to come see them. Now, Doug had been there, so he told us that the trip would be extremely hard physically because the location is in the jungled mountains of a Pacific Island nation. It's a primitive village, no running water, electricity, or Chick-fil-A's. There are no roads to this village. It would take a multi-day hike through the bush. We would be crossing class five whitewater rivers, climbing muddy mountains, enduring days of endless rain, risking malaria, and roughing the wild. After much prayer on John's part and much nail biting by me, we set off. And this is what we saw. Vanuatu at Port Ulri, and as you can see, it's amazing. We're going to try to cross over to this island that you see behind me. Usually, you only go when the tide is low. The tide is not low right now. Should have brought some shoes because it's sharp. John, you're uh, drifting off uh, to the side a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna bag my phone up and see if I can swim the rest of the way. Well, I'm on a somewhat deserted island off the coast of Vanuatu. I guess I'll explore and let you know if I see anything interesting. Here's a piggy. Hopefully he not mean. But look at him, they're, they're following us. They wait, <laughs> wait, <laughs> we want to eat. We're getting surrounded by pigs and we just felt an earthquake. So we're gonna get off this little <laughs> deserted island. So I know that most people come to Vanuatu for white sand beaches and island resorts, but that's not why we're here. We're here to go farther in and farther up. Vanuatu is a chain of islands. So after waiting a day for another flight, we finally made it to the island where we would be spending most of our time, Espiritu Santo, or just Santo to the locals. We finally met Pastor Jonas and his brother Macchio, who is the chief of the mountain village of Lakinakinai. We still had miles to hike before we would arrive at our destination, but we rested in the coastal city of Lugansville for a day before we began our journey up the mountain. This gave us the wonderful opportunity to get acquainted. We brought bags full of new books for the people of Lakinakinai. Doug, who is able to speak the local trade language, gave Pastor Jonas a crash course on my new book, Eternal Clarity. We joked that, compared to what was to come, our accommodations in Lugansville were plush. We would soon be roughing it in the midst of the wild. The next day, we began the grandest journey of my life. First order of business, secure the pig. 
in a sack. Now this is the amazing thing about transporting a baby pig. If you cut the corner out of a rice bag for his snout, you now have a perfect hog cage. Next item on the agenda, fit as many people as possible in the back of a four-wheel drive Land Cruiser. Now, if you live in North America, you have a false idea about how many human bodies can be packed into the bed of a truck. Next, find something to hang on to because you're about to drive down a road as bumpy as the Sierra Nevada mountains. We drove over water-filled holes deep enough to install a high dive. And when the road flattened out slightly, the driver got confused, thinking he had entered a NASCAR tournament, forgetting the 16 people in the bed and one squealing pig, of course. The driver stopped at a village in the middle of the night and would risk no more distance. No English explanation was provided, but much was said in Bishlama. Doug listened and translated. Oh, time to put on some shoes, Doug said. We've got some rivers to cross. No problem, it's only midnight in the jungle in the rainy season. We found out later that one of the recent cyclones knocked out the concrete bridge that led to our mid-journey waypoint. We could hear the river singing its thunderous melody from a quarter mile away. It was no babbling brook. Our new friends hoisted over a hundred pounds of new books on their shoulders and crossed effortlessly. That morning, I woke with a racing heart and a terrible knot in my stomach. Now, I had a standing offer to remain behind at this village while everyone else made the multi-day hike, but I chose to face my fear and follow my new friends into the mountains. After a day of hiking, who knows how many miles, up rivers and painful climbs, we stopped at a village in the mid-mountains called Vunimalus. The people welcomed us in and gave us a place to stay for the night. We met such incredible hospitality everywhere we went. Doug also took the opportunity to share more of my books with the locals, talking about Jesus and faith. Next day, we got back on the trail. The hills were each morning blanketed by fog and threaded through with waterways that beat constantly with the thrumming rhythm of life-giving waters, which poured out of every crack of the rain-drenched mountains. There was never a shortage of help for us, the foreigners who could hardly survive such violent torrents without holding the hands of our tireless new friends. At times they gently guided us, at others they pulled us along. 
There were even occasions they had to simply lift us up from moss-covered rocks and pass us down a human chain spanning treacherous rivers. The trip's myriad dangers only heightened the various rewards won by hard hiking and rain-soaked endurance. God's creation, nearly untouched by Westerners, was arrayed for our exclusive wonderment as we marveled at what such a wondrous creator had made. Along the way, we stopped in a mountain village called Volvero for a night's sleep. The village used to have a church, but it had been abandoned a few years prior. The village was poor and lonely. The mosquitoes were big, and the painful night's sleep we had left us sore the next morning. This is where we slept last night. It hurt, <laughs> and there were bad mosquitoes. So what I did is I wet this blanket because it was so hot and covered myself completely with the wet blanket to keep the mosquitoes off. When the morning came, we were happy to be on our way. After days of hiking, we were drawing near to the village of Lakinakinai, sort of. Uh, the recent cyclone destroyed much of their previous village and forced them to rebuild. Instead of building on the site of the old village, they picked a new location halfway up yet another mountain. The old village of Lakinakinai has been located in the same place for hundreds of years, dating back to the days of their ancestors' cannibalism and black magic. But that generation is long gone. We had one more climb to make, before we would finally arrive at our ultimate destination, which was New Lakinakinai. We finally arrived in Lakinakinai after two days of the hardest hiking I've ever been on. But after all of that, we got up here and we were just amazed at the view, the amazing beauty, and you can see it behind me. Just so incredibly vast is the landscape out here. They gave us the nicest place in town to stay. And we were so happy to have a roof over our heads on account of the incredible amount of rain. The mud here is just insanity. And this is the village. This is right in the middle of the village. And it's just sloppy, messy mud everywhere you go. And that's mostly because it just rains constantly. This is our source for drinking water. It catches rain that runs off of the roof. This is our place for taking a shower if we want to, but all it is is a bucket where you dump water on yourself. And then as soon as you come out, you get muddy again. One of the villagers jokingly calls this the promised land, though we call it the outhouse. You'll notice this stick here propped up. That means that there's no one in it, but if the stick's down, it's occupied.
the background you can hear the sound of mourning. <laughs> they, um, they just got the news that someone from another village, uh, someone's mother has died. And so the whole village joins in mourning in these, uh, these wails and these sounds. It's amazing how close and together they all are, that uh, one, one person's mourning is shared by all of them. Apart from that single incident where we heard the sounds of grieving, the village was actually full of laughter and music all the time. However, for generations it had been locked in a cycle of murder, black magic, and cannibalism. So what changed this place into a joyful haven? Well, when Jonas was 26, he heard a missionary on a visit to a distant village. A few years later, Jonas was in a terrible car wreck and broke his arm. He was in the hospital for months in the city. He got tetanus and lockjaw, but during that treacherous time, he decided he would go to Bible college. Now, he couldn't read or write English or Bishlami. On arriving, the professor told him he couldn't stay in Bible college if he couldn't read or write. Jonas, being tenacious, talked him into giving him a month to learn. The professor didn't believe it was possible, but he underestimated what a Lakinaki Nai man could do, especially one who was seeking God's help. So Jonas prayed that God would give him the ability to read, and he worked incredibly hard day and night to learn. A month later, the professor was astounded and allowed him to stay in Bible college because he could read and write. A few years later, Jonas started the independent church in Lakinakinai, his home village. That took place in 2008. But it was difficult beginning. He started meetings in his house. He was challenged by those who practiced black magic. The murder and infant mortality rates were still very high. He felt deeply opposed by the evil spirits which had reigned over those mountains for many generations. Initially, many were angry when they heard about Jesus, but little by little, he made connections. Jonas's family were the first to believe. As the numbers grew, they built a basic shelter for the church. Once the heads of household began to believe, it wasn't long before the entire village had converted to Christianity. And things began to change at that point. The children began to grow up. Murder and black magic became a thing of memory. As the church grew in influence, several legalistic teachers from other villages tried to get control of the church at remote Lakinakinai. Each brought many restrictions and legalistic rules. Each tried to coerce Jonas and the church elders to join their denomination. But Jonas stood strong. He saw that the denominations would bring many challenges and troubles, not to mention a type of legalism he didn't want for his sheep. He refused their offers and kept the church independent. Now this is unique in Vanuatu because virtually every church, we're told, is part of a denomination. Now, when Doug met Jonas, the church had already been established for six years. They met in 2014. As their relationship grew, however, Doug gave Jonas my book, Salvation and Discipleship. Now, in that book, I show how the Bible teaches that we receive salvation by faith alone in Christ alone and not by works. Jonas saw something in the book I had never imagined it could be used for. 
He not only realized that salvation is a free gift given by God to those who believe, but he also realized that if salvation is free, it was okay for the church of Laki Naki Nai to be independent and to not join a denomination. He recognized the legalism of the denominations and he didn't want to place those kinds of restrictions upon salvation, baptism, and church life. So, in my book, he found a kind of freedom he had been looking for. I was so surprised, as if it wasn't enough that the book had found its way into the remote mountains of Santo Island, it had also helped this remote church fight off legalism and remain under the graceful care of its loving elders. So now, the church takes care of the needs of the people of Laki Naki Nai. The church initiated a cattle project that brings meaningful work and income to the village. Through Doug's advice and help, it's been able to grow. Now they have over 30 cattle. With the income this brings in, the church can pay for school fees for the village's children, many of which attend schools in the city. So, what transformed the remote village of Lakinakinai from a den of black magic wielding murderers into a place of peace and security? Simply the gospel, the church, and its godly leadership. And it's all to the glory of God. In this building that you can see behind me, uh, we meet every day since we've gotten here. We meet in the morning for about four hours. And during that time, uh, John and I teach from the Bible and they love pictures. So we realized that after the first day that if we could draw pictures of what we're teaching, they really, really love that. And so we've taught in the mornings and then we do a session in the evening before we go to bed. Um, and it, it's, it's the whole village. They all come, they all learn, and they seem so incredibly appreciative of what they're learning. What they keep telling us is that uh, the teaching that they used to get um, outside of this village and have heard before is not clear. It's confusing. And so they're, they're very appreciative of the simple um, approach that we take to um, just explaining the Bible. So we're not, we're not really preaching. We're just kind of going through scripture and explaining uh, what, uh, what it means. And they really love it. But we need to ask him for that help. I've had times where I am very tempted In our ministry, we often use John 3.16, along with a simple drawn diagram to communicate God's free gift of eternal life that we receive by believing in Jesus. So, my father-in-law John's teaching goal for the week was not only for them to learn the diagram, but to have them able to share it with others in their own language, all by themselves. This came with its own challenges, of course, you see, we were surprised to find out that they had to translate John 3.16 to do this. And that's because, as of yet, they do not have a translation of the Gospel of John in their tribal language. We watched in awe as the entire congregation worked together aloud to make a translation of John 3.16 into Tiale. Here's what they came up with. John 3.16 Oh, 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 oh,
Once that was accomplished, John began to turn each day's drawing of the diagram over to the literate members of the church. By the end of our time there, they were able to use John 3.16 and this simple diagram to share the gospel in their own tribal language of Tiale. Seeing a parent share a clear gospel message with his own child in their own language was a special kind of reward. Lakinakinai is unique in one respect in that the entirety of the village, they're all believers and they all go to church. And uh, that's unique in the island here at the, basically the church and the village are one in the same, which is pretty amazing. Once we were in the mountain village of Lakinakinai, it was hard to imagine the incredibly violent past the locals had experienced. For many generations, the people had lived in a state of murder, war, cannibalism, black magic, and dark spiritual forces. They believed that the ground had become cursed because of all of the murder that had taken place there and nothing edible would grow successfully in their soil. It certainly didn't seem cursed to our eyes. So what happened in the intervening years? Well, after Pastor Jonas established the church in the village, he gathered the people for a prayer meeting. They prayed that God would remove the curse from the ground. That time of prayer took place on Doug's first visit to the village in 2014. Clearly. Whatever curse there had been, it was no longer a factor because the land of Lakinakinai is lush, green, and exploding with edible goodies. So I think it was the first night that we were here and we started teaching, they were asking us questions about baptism and they were unique questions, questions I hadn't gotten before. Like one was, are they supposed to get baptized every time they meet for church? Because apparently there's some missionaries here that do that, where they baptize them, they make them get baptized every week. Um, and they had some other interesting questions. And so we went through and explained baptism to them, what the purpose was. and. Pastor Jonas just told us this morning that they want to do a baptism today because they didn't understand it before. In all, we baptized 23 individuals. We had the great honor of baptizing all age ranges from children to heads of household to mothers. We even baptized the chief of the village. So I just baptized a bunch of kids from the village and uh, I guess in their excitement they left me behind and so I'm trying to figure out how to get back. Oh, this should be interesting. 
Okay, okay, I think I, I think I remember this. Okay, I hear voices in the distance. Um, and I'm pretty sure this is land that they've cleared for bulls, so I'm probably not too far. I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but it's, uh, it's raining again, so that's cool. Uh, but it's nothing new, it basically has rained the whole time. Actually, anytime we go outside, it rains. Whether it's raining when we're inside, I, I don't know. Maybe it is too. Okay, this is, this is ringing a bell. What is this thing? Looks like something from the Predator movies. There's some ladies carrying some leaves. Maybe, maybe I could follow them to the village. Got me some sugar cane from some ladies in the woods. And while I'm walking, I guess I'll give it a shot. From what I understand, you, you chew it, but you don't swallow it. Oh, that's good. And then I guess you spit it out. Good thing I've got some because I haven't brushed my teeth in, I don't know, maybe a week. But I hear that sugar cane is good for that. Holy bananas. I gotta go down this? Good grief. I mean... So I made it back to the village, but not without a doozy of a fall on that uh, slope I just showed you. My foot went through the ground and caught and I tumbled all the way down to the bottom. And there was this spike. Uh, along these paths, there's these spikes just sticking out everywhere where they've cut, cut wood. And this spike came like right to my face. <laughs> and, uh, and those two ladies that were uh, carrying the leaves came up and saw me fall and came up and, and helped me. And then they gave me some more sugar cane because the one I had was just doused in mud. So I don't think I lacerated anything, but I did take a little bit of a little bit of a scratch. So anyway, happy to be back without losing a leg. On our last day here, the sun finally came out and we get to see some blue sky and the scenery is really, really breathtaking. Our time here in these remote mountains has been a life altering experience something we will never forget. And we are truly grateful for all we've seen, heard, and been a part of in Lakinakinai. It seemed like most of the village accompanied us back to the city to see us safely to the airport. But on our way, we stopped in the city and were amazed once again by the Lakinakinai people. So it is true that they are a bush dwelling tribe, but they are not uncomfortable among the city folk. In fact, they were incredibly evangelistic with perfect strangers. Here's a Jehovah's Witness stand for distributing literature. And here's the Lakinakinai people sharing the gospel with people who happened to wander by on the street. <laughs> As we waited in town for our departure time, they shared my books, which happened to be about the Bible, Jesus, and faith. They shared them with half a dozen strangers, to the point where they were running out of the scores of books we brought for them. They were that generous and that eager to share the message. Before we left, Jonas told me he was getting calls from acquaintances from all over the island who wanted to know how he had an independent church and how they could do the same.
They also heard he was giving out free books, and they wanted some of those too. We were constantly astonished how God had grown the Lakinakinai people strong in the mountains of Santo. And now he was bringing that strength to a growing population around the island. Well, it was sad to leave, especially since we have no idea when or even if we will ever be able to make it to Lakinakinai again. We left confident we will meet them once more when Christ returns, because they are truly our brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs>